It's on, huh? All right. We're having to use some secondary app stuff here in order to have sound on uh, on Facebook Live. So um, hopefully this little lapel mic is live and working. Verla can check it on her iPad. So, um, <clears throat> okay, this morning here is uh, kind of the lull after the storm. It's pretty quiet out there, but it rained forever yesterday and was really blowing. So the the Wilson River here is uh, like like probably over the edges in some in some places. So anyway, but we've seen lots worse floods around here. So um, oh, this morning then in the worship service is uh, communion service. So just a reminder, you want to have. Uh, bread and cup there, and we will we will ha include communion in the in the worship service. So uh, I can't think of any other announcements. So let's pray and we'll start. Father, we ask your blessing on our class today. <clears throat> we pray that you would give us a a better understanding of your word. We thank you for your word and and thank you that we can have a certain record of your dealings with this lost world and, and uh, people like us who were born into this world lost in sin and how you brought Christ to us as our Savior. And so we, we, uh, we thank you for this and we thank you for this class time and we pray that in Christ's name, amen. Okay, what I wanted to do, we had left off on in the text, in the history text, on page 313 down about the, <clears throat> the middle of it. And, um, but I wanted us to have a little bit of biblical background. And you'll, we'll come across an example here when we get a few pages into the textbook of why it's important for us to not only read the textbook, um, but also to read and be aware of what is in what the Bible says about those same periods of time as well. And you'll see, we'll come across a good example of that um, this morning. If you go back in your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 16, I've got it on the screen here if, if you want to uh, look at it there, but... Um, this chapter that we're in in the textbook, chapter 47, the title of it is The Dynasty of Omri, King Omri of uh, the Northern Kingdom of Israel. And the book spends a few pages talking about him. Actually, the scripture spends only, uh, well, here we got verse 21 down to 28. So about seven or eight verses there is all there is about Omri reigning in the in the northern kingdom uh, <clears throat> and but at, at any rate back in in this chapter uh, 1 Kings 16 we we start in on an interesting section that that you know, of scripture that that is surprisingly long um, and it concerns King Ahab in uh, Israel northern kingdom so ahab as you can see verse 28 here omri slept with his fathers and was buried in samaria remember that's the false counterfeit capital there in the northern kingdom of israel and ahab his son reigned in his place okay now ahab like his father was a wicked man and he um uh, his sins exceeded the sins of Omri, uh, his father. You can see here in verse, uh, so, so Ahab is going to reign over Israel and Samaria 22 years. So he's king for quite, quite a long time. And in verse 30, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord. Check this out more than all who were before him. And um, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk 
in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar uh, for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah, uh, another idolatrous deity. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Um, so here we have the account of an incredibly evil king and an incredibly evil queen, right? I mean, who, who's going who's gonna to name their daughter Jezebel, right? I mean, Jezebel, the name of Jezebel uh, is like a title for <clears throat> an evil an evil woman, you know, she is a, she is, a, if you said someone is a Jezebel, well, and you know, um, um, her name crops up again in the letters to the churches. I think it's the letters to the churches, chapters two and three in, uh, in Revelation, where uh, a wicked <coughs> uh, woman in introducing idolatry into one of the churches is called, is called a Jezebel there. So, um, all right, so here's this section starting here in 1 Kings 16 about um, King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. And, and what is, what's surprising to me, or should be, and it should be surprising to us uh, as, we, as we look at it, is how much space in Scripture is devoted to uh, God's, God's, the, the reign of Ahab and God's dealings with him. So here he begins to reign. You see here that uh, a king in the, in the southern kingdom, Judah, Asa, uh, had reigned there for 38 years. I might be mistaken. I have to check on this. I think Asa was a godly king. But um, all right, so let, let me just kind of scroll down here. And we come to chapter 17. Now, you see, it's during the reign of Ahab that we have these records of Elijah, of at least Elijah, and then, and then uh, Elisha comes on, this, on the scene as well. So here is Elijah. And again, uh, the Bible... Um, the Bible spends a lot of time with the ministry of Elijah under the reign of Ahab, and then on into uh, um, goes on even into Second Kings with Elisha. So Elijah comes first, and so here he is predicting a drought, and you can find reference to this in the. New Testament, is it in James that talks about uh, the prayers of a righteous man accomplish much and so forth and speaks about Elijah and, and, the, and the drought. And so Elijah is just um, going at it against this wicked king, Ahab, and of course uh, the wicked queen, Jezebel. You have the account of this widow in Zarephath that God sends Elijah to, and uh, um, he, remember the, the miracle of providing oil and, and uh, flour for, for the widow. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. And then later, Elijah raises her son from the dead, all right? And that's chapter 17. Then we go to chapter 18. Here's a confrontation of Elijah uh, confronting uh, King Ahab. All right, so here's this, this battle. And, uh, and, and what you have as you, as you take a look at, again, how much 
space is devoted to the days of Ahab and Jezebel and Elijah and Elisha is uh, we, we are supposed to get a, a, a big picture message of, of what's going on here. Is, and this is, it is, uh, at least we're supposed to see that this is showing us the ongoing battle and conflict between the kingdom of the devil and the kingdom of God. All right, that's that's what this is really, that's what this is really all about. And and we are not going to be at all surprised if we see uh, references in the New Testament that uh, ref- reference these events back here in the in the Old Testament, because remember. The Old Testament then is, uh, provides a, a picture, a, a symbols and types and so forth of, of something bigger, something that, that comes to more fulfillment than in the, in the New Testament. So Elijah is confronting Ahab here and uh, uh, then here is that great test on Mount Carmel, all right? Uh, probably Carmel in chapter uh, in chapter 18, the prophets of Baal defeated. So, see, the northern kingdom had become so corrupt because of Ahab and Jezebel introducing Baal worship and so on. They even have uh, a, a priesthood and and prophets uh, of of Baal of, the, of this wicked false religion that's how that's how incredibly evil all of this uh, was that was that was going on and, and you would probably remember the story about <clears throat> how uh, how Elijah challenged the the prophets of Baal he challenged them to call on their God and and uh, bring down fire fire from heaven and and when this was all over Elijah um, had all of those wicked prophets and priesthood uh, killed wi- and, 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 wipe, and wiped them out. So um, Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. Okay. Now, in this section here, especially in in the accounts of Elijah and Elisha and the kings in the north, you see this kind of uh, um, intense judgment on the wicked quite a few times. Um, So, I mean, just think about this. Elijah, the prophet of God, told the people, seize the prophets of Baal, and they did, and they slaughtered them. They slaughtered him. It would have been a, 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 bloody, a bloody affair. And, and uh, Elijah, this was God's will. This was, uh, Elijah was, was blessed by the Lord. This was the Lord speaking through Elijah. This is the Lord doing this to the wicked. And so what we're seeing is um, an account of of a picture of what happens in when Christ comes again and how he's going to he's going to deal with the wicked. You know, a lot of people that claim to be Christians object to this kind of a thing. They don't they don't like this. This is where they'll they'll say, "Well, <clears throat> you know, Elijah went too far." And we're going to see another example of that a little bit later. Well, Elijah went too far um or, you know, they'll, they'll look for some way to dismiss this kind of a thing. Now, granted, nobody's saying, we're not saying that we should all take uh, weapons and go out and slaughter the Lord's enemies today. But, you know, Christ is going to. I mean, <clears throat> when he comes again, and, and you can read about it not just in an Old Testament book, but in New Testament. Take a look at Second Thessalonians chapter two, then for instance. So that that when that when he comes, we're going to also see examples here 
of kings who sinned by not killing the enemy, all right? Uh, remember back in the days of Saul, <clears throat> and he let that, what was it, Agag or whatever that king was, let him live, and he was rebuked by Samuel for, uh, for doing it. Uh, the drought ends, Elijah <clears throat> meets up with Ahab and, and rebukes him, and then, uh, and then pronounces that the rain is going to come, and, and, and it does, all right? It's amazing, isn't it, that all of these things, they, I mean, <coughs> Elijah's victory, the Lord's victory on Mount Carmel, uh, pronouncing this drought, what was it, like three and a half years, then he pronounces that the drought's over and it starts to rain, and yet Ahab, Jezebel, and the wicked, do they repent? No, they do not. They do not repent. <coughs> now, you know, it's kind of a surprising account here in chapter 19 where Elijah flees Jezebel. There's been this great victory and boldness. And then here he, what, um, kind, of, kind of caves, you know, but the Lord strengthens him, meets him, <clears throat> provides him. See, this, is where he, this is where he sent some bread with a, uh, what is this, an angel, arise, arise and eat for the journey is too great for you. And so um, the Lord <coughs> speaks to Elijah and uh, that's where they have that little conversation of, you know, Elijah's like, I'm the only one left. And the Lord, uh, the Lord told him that, you know, here's this little line he has. I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. The people of Israel have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword, and it's all true. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And they seek my life to take it away. Well, as it turns out, the Lord's going to, to uh, clue him in. He wasn't the only one left. God always, always, always has a, uh, a remnant, okay? There's always a remnant, and we see that doctrine taught in the New Testament um, more, than, <clears throat> more than once, okay? Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, here it is in First King in 19, verse 18. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him, okay? 7,000. If you look over, is it in, yeah, here it is. Romans 11, check it out here. Paul quotes uh, Elijah, Lord, they've killed your prophets. They've demolished your altars and I alone am left and they seek my life. But what's God's reply to him? I've kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And so here, here's the punchline here. So too at the present time, that's now, there is a remnant chosen by grace, okay? That's what um, every Christian is. That's what the true church is. It is a remnant <clears throat> that exists only then, only because of God's, of God's grace. So, all right, let's go back here again. Uh, now, Elisha comes on the scene here, and... Um, uh, that's chapter 19. And then we have accounts of Ahab's wars with Syria. <clears throat> he, Ahab actually wins some of these wars, but he, he spares this uh, enemy king, and God's prophets rebuke him then uh, for it. Uh, see, here it is. A prophet condemns Ben-Hadad's release because... Ahab had actually made a covenant with this enemy, enemy king and, <clears throat> and released him. And so God's prophet comes and denounces him for that. Here's the account of another wicked evil of Ahab and Jezebel, where they kill the righteous Naboth and they take, it, and they take his vineyard. Okay, 
So, and then the Lord's prophet Elijah comes and, uh, and condemns Ahab for what he had done. Now, with all that background, check this out. Yeah, this kind of blows you, blows you away. 1 Kings 21, 25. There was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab, whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. He acted very abominably in going after idols as the Amorites had done, whom the Lord cast out before the people of Israel. And when Ahab heard those words, that is the prophet's judgment, uh, uh, prophet's statement of the Lord's judgment on Ahab, when Ahab heard those words, he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about dejectedly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? So in other words, he wasn't faking it. Because he's humbled himself before me, I will not bring the disaster in his days, that is disaster upon the nation, but in his son's days, I will bring the disaster upon his house. And what's gonna happen is all of his household and descendants and so forth are going to, are going to be wiped out, all right? So, but, uh, um, but this, this is rather amazing. What was the other evil king's name? Um, Manasseh was it? Is that right? That that he that he repented. He repented later on. Um, so this is striking. Does this mean Ahab is going to be in heaven? I don't know, but uh, um, I, we'll we'll find out someday. But it is it is remarkable here. Um, 1 Kings 22, here it is where Ahab, the king of Israel in the north, he meets up with the uh, king of Judah, Jehoshaphat. And um, he says that, you know, um, Ramoth Gilead belongs to us here in the north. And uh, the king of Syria has taken it over. We should go to war and, and, get, and get it back. And he asked Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, to go to battle with him. He asked him to do it. And Jehoshaphat says yes, but he, he tells Ahab, first of all, inquire uh, for the word of the Lord. You know, let, let's find out if this is something that the Lord wants us to do. Well, what what Ahab does is he gathers together the false prophets that were around him. Uh, he liked them because they told him what he wanted to what he wanted to hear. Shall I go to battle against Ramoth Gilead or shall I refrain? And they said, "Go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king." Now, there's a lesson for us right there, and that is that um, there will always be preachers, pastors, churches, professing Christians, whatever you want to call them, there will always be people like that who will tell us what we want to hear, okay? That's what Paul tells Timothy about, that in these last days, there people are going to lay up preachers for themselves, right, that tickle their ears. Oh, that's nice. That's what I want to hear. Everything's fine. And we're seeing that. I mean, the, the whole, the, the majority, the large majority of local churches today, that's the kind of people that they have standing in the pulpits. That's uh, ear ticklers. That's what they, the people, the people want to uh, want to hear. Why, what is the motive of these false prophets? Well, Ahab, he's going re to reward them. He's going to promote them, and it's the same thing today. Um, this happens uh, all the time, all the time that, that people, I wrote a, in fact, this last week I wrote a 
blog article. I think it's on the blog uh, Light for Dark Times. I think it published on uh, Friday. And I talk some about this very, this very thing here. This is why pastors of churches uh, modify their preaching so that wicked people who aren't really Christians can be assured that the Lord's blessing them and they're saved and, and so on. Well, why is it? Well, the, you know, there's not much, there's not much profit or, or money or glory in confronting the wicked, right? And we, all right, let's go on. Let's see what happens to uh, a Christian or a preacher that confronts the wicked. Jehoshaphat said, is there not here another prophet of the Lord of whom we may inquire? Now, this part here, I think, is a bit to Jehoshaphat's credit because he's like, uh, I don't know about these guys. These seem to be a bunch of yes men. Do you have another prophet here? It's almost like he's thinking he's wise to these guys. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah, the son of Imla, but I hate him. Ha! I hate him, for he never prophesies good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. All right, let not the king. Oh, may that not be. I don't know exactly what he meant by that. But, but you see this? This is what's going on. The wicked who are parading as Christians today, all right? The wicked, the, the counterfeits. And, uh, and you, you realize, I hope you realize that the, the majority, the large majority of people down through the history of the church and today who claim to be Christians are not, all right? The thing is, the thing is, is fake and, and it's prevalent. So, um, and, and, and they listen to false teachers because the false teachers tell them what they want to hear. And that's, this is a perfect example of that. Um, Ahab says, I hate him. He never prophesies good concerning me, but evil. So I know over the years we've seen that in this church. I mean, there was times when people are bailing out left, left and right because they had been uh, used to hearing messages from the pulpit that, that uh, assured them they're on their way to heaven, they're fine Christians, and then and then suddenly they're not hearing that any, anymore and being called to examine themselves. And I remember there was one lady that had been here for a long time before, before we came, but uh, one of her last Sundays here was she announced to people at the back of the church on the way out that, that uh, she comes to church to, be, to hear things that will make her feel good about herself, you see, and she didn't like that. She wasn't feeling good, so she pretty quick she's off to some other so-called church and gonna pro probably still there hearing, hearing what a fine Christian she is and, and, and so on. But, but so this happens here. I, I hate him. He never prophesies good concerning me, but evil. Well, you know, guess what? Um, really what Micaiah was was prophesying to Ahab was for his good, right? But he saw it, Ahab saw it then as, as evil. Well, anyway, you know, they bring Micaiah in and Micaiah, he, he kind of plays with Ahab at, at first and said, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> let's see here, where is it? Oh yeah, here it is in verse 15. Initially, he tells you know, they say, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall we refrain? And Micaiah answers, oh, go up, go up and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. Well, all of a sudden Ahab knows that he's, he's playing with him. He says, the king said to him, uh, how many times shall I make you swear that you speak to me? Nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord. Okay, fine. So Micaiah does. And basically what he tells him is, you're going you're gonna to be um, defeated. And, uh, and then he, Ahab turns to Jehoshaphat and says, 
I told you he wouldn't prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And, uh, and then Micaiah goes, he goes on, and, uh, and we see this account of what's going on behind the scenes, this evil spirit sent from the Lord to entice Ahab, that he would, that he would uh, go up. And how does he do it? By what means? I will go out the line, uh, <clears throat> and, and, this, and will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, you are to entice him, and you succeed, go out and do so. This is why the New Testament tells us to, in 1 John, I think it's chapter 4, test the spirits. Test the spirits to see whether they be of God. Because behind every preacher standing in a pulpit, behind every theologian writing books, behind every person that claims to be a Christian and is telling you what the Bible says, then is, there's a spirit. And it's either the Holy Spirit or it's a lying, enticing spirit. It's, 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 one, it's a one, of the, one of the two, okay? And, uh, and so we, we are to be then very, very discerning. The Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these, your prophets. The Lord has declared disaster for you. So, uh, and so I, I suppose you see another lesson here, and that is that <clears throat> any person who says they want to hear God's word, okay, I, all right, they say, I want to I hear what God has to say to me, but in fact, what they really want is only good, what, what they want, right? Good stuff, ear tickling. And there comes a point where God will step back and he'll say, fine, fine. Uh, and this is, a, this is a form of God's judgment upon the, the visible church. When people... <clears throat> um, desire to hear, to have their ears tickled, right? When they desire that, ultimately there comes a point where God, God in his irony and his judgment will say, okay, fine, I'll send you ear ticklers. Here, here you go. Uh, and, uh, and then it is ultimately then to their, to their destruction. Ahab gets killed in battle there and... Uh, um, it's kind of classic here, uh, verse 22. You see, this is really a good example of the, of the providence of God and how he controls every little detail, okay? But a certain man drew his bow at random and struck the king of Israel but between the scale armor and the breastplate. Therefore, he said to the driver of his chariot, turn around and carry me out of the battle, for I'm wounded. And then he's going he's gonna to die. But you see that, isn't that, isn't that, it's kind of neat, actually, right? A certain man, it's just, a, just somebody out here, a certain man, right? He, he, he draws his bow, and, and it's almost like, it says at random. So it's kind of like um, a flock shot, you know, it's like... Uh, a group of ducks flying over a big group of ducks and you just kind of let fly one and whatever well that's what the, and and God's control of that arrow and that man is so perfect that that it strikes Ahab in this little tiny dividing line <clears throat> uh, between his armor and breastplate so it go it goes through instead of instead of bouncing off okay so there's all kinds of really great lessons in, that, um, in, in this section. Jehoshaphat continues to reign in Judah. Uh, As Ahaziah, comes, a wicked king, comes to the throne in Israel. That's the end of 1 Kings 22. In fact, it's the end of 1 Kings. And this brings us to 2 Kings. Elijah is still going, all right? It's still giving us an account of Elijah and uh, in, on into 2 Kings. And let's see here, that's chapter 1. 
Elijah, remember this, chariot caught up, chariot of fire, taken up to heaven, replaced by Elisha, okay? And uh, so we have that account. Elisha succeeds Elijah, and Moab rebels against Israel. And, um, okay, here's more of God's miracles performed through Elisha, and Elisha is still a prophet to the northern kingdom. So this is Elisha and the widow's oil, Elisha and the Shunammite woman, more miracles. Elisha raises the Shunammite son. This is examples of the spirit of Elijah uh, operating in the same way on Elijah. Elisha purifies the deadly stew and is somewhere here in there an account of a axe handle. He heals Naaman, the Syrian, of, uh, and uh, then, let's see here, go on. Yeah, here it is. He floats the axe head. <laughs> All right, another, another miracle there. Horses and chariots. Anyway, you, you can see, look at how much of a big section of Scripture here in, second, in First and Second Kings is devoted to Ahab and Jezebel, Elijah and Elisha. It's not surprising then that when that at the close of the Old Testament, um, <clears throat> we we um, in, in Malachi that that it closes with a promise that Elijah would would come again, right? And uh, the New Testament opens with Elijah. It's John. It's John the Baptist. So so um, lots of background here in the Old Testament that's going to come up again in the, in the New Testament. Now, if we take a look here then at um, uh, chapter 47, and we had left off <clears throat> on page 313, I just wanted to show you a couple of things here. The title of this chapter is the dynasty of Omri, and, and remember, we, he's Ahab's father. That's Ahab's father. And he, uh, his reign is uh, described, 1 Kings 16, but it's only in just a few verses. He isn't given much of an account. But what the author of the book here does is give us some of the, the background of what's going on. Omri was, was a wicked king, and, uh, and then he dies. Ahab, Ahab comes on the scene. Let me read just a little bit here. Uh, page 313, uh, second paragraph from the bottom here. Ahab was more successful in war and affairs of state than in religious matters. Ben-Hadad, the first of Damascus, was greedy for Israelite land. Okay, so Damascus is to the north of the northern kingdom of Israel, but Ahab was able to defend his territory. So successful was Ahab that he actually captured the enemy king. Ben-Hadad offered to restore Israelite land that he and his father had conquered and to give commercial rights in Damascus to Israelite traders. Ahab generously, now, now here, Here's an example, and I'm going to show you another example in a minute, but here's an example of whenever you're reading any kind of a book other than Scripture, uh, you want to you know, realize this is not perfect, and, uh, and you're going to find some errors. The, the adjective, or I guess adverb here, generously, that's not a good pick. That's not a good word to use. Really what's presented to us in Scripture about Ahab not killing this enemy king and in, instead making a covenant with him, um, a better adverb to use there would be Ahab foolishly and wickedly okay, made a treaty with Ben-Hadad 
on terms that permitted the king of Damascus to return home with a light punishment. An unnamed Israelite prophet condemned Ahab for this kindness. See there again, it's like, what are you, what are you thinking? I'm not, I wouldn't pick that word. Kindness toward Israel's enemy, all right? The prophet's attitude is comparable to that of Samuel at the time Saul spared King Agag, okay? Although risking the ire, anger of Yahweh's prophets, Ahab may have had political reasons for sparing Ben-Hadad. Now here again, <clears throat> the author of this book is a conservative, and he, I mean, he believes in the inspiration of scripture, Charles Pfeiffer. He was, uh, he was on the faculty at, at Moody Bible Institute, among other places. But, but sometimes uh, it seems to me that he, um, what do I want to say? He becomes too humanistic or, or too, um, um, it's almost like he leaves the Lord out of the picture. Maybe this happens to you if you're caught up in the study of history and archaeology and so forth. I, I don't know, I'm not describing it very well, but I think you'll see what I mean as we go through. Although, so he says here, although risking the ire, the anger of Yahweh's prophets. Well, really what Ahab was risking was God's anger, okay? Um, it's almost get impression, well, are these, do you believe these guys are, these prophets are speaking for the Lord or not, right? Ahab may have had political reasons for sparing Ben-Hadad. Well, of course, in the scripture, it doesn't matter. He, he was disobeying the Lord. An enemy more deadly than the Syrian state of Damascus was posing a threat. And this is Assyria up to the north. When Shalmaneser III of Assyria, okay, successor to Asher Nasserpal, attempted to bring all of Western Asia into his empire, the Arameans of Damascus, all, all of this stuff, all these people are to the north of Israel, in that, remember, in that fertile crescent area. And their neighbors settled their differences and prepared a united defense of their lands. In 853 BC, the Allied states challenged Assyria's expansionism in a battle fought at Karkar on the Orontes River. The monolith inscription of Shalmaneser III, now in the British Museum, credits Ben-Hadad with providing a contingent of 1,200 chariots, 1,200 horses, and 20,000 infantry. Ahab the Israelite is said to have provided 2,000 chariots, but only 10,000 infantry. The Assyrians gained a victory at Karkar. Shalmaneser boasted that he made the blood of his enemies flow down the valleys, and that he scattered their corpses far and wide. When the Assyrians withdrew, however, life went on much as it had before the battle. Shalmaneser was busy in the east following his victory at Karkar, and several years went by before another Assyrian army appeared in Western Asia. Now, I should just, I should show you this here. Uh, I don't know where are we at here. Let me go. I think it was right here. Yeah. Okay. So now see, here's another example. Remember the Moabite stone we looked at last time. Well, here's another steel, S-T-E-L-E -E, or obelisk. It's in a stone monument. Okay. That's what these guys would do. They would make a stone monument with uh, inscriptions on it. Uh, boasting about their exploits and their victories. And so this one here, the black obelisk of Shalmaneser III, um, <clears throat> let, me, let me read it to you here from, this is Wikipedia, okay? The black obelisk of Shalmaneser III is a black limestone Assyrian sculpture with many scenes in base relief. I guess base relief just is what you see in the picture there. It's kind of like raised raised uh, 
um, inscriptions on there and pictures. Uh, it comes from Nimrud, ancient, uh, it's, it's up in the north in that Fertile Crescent area of Assyria. In, oh, here it is, northern Iraq. So it was found in that area and commemorates the deeds of King Shalmaneser III. It's on display in the British Museum in London and several other museums have cast replicas. Okay. <clears throat> it is the most complete Assyrian obelisk, that's another name for this stone, a stone like this, yet discovered and is historically significant. Check this out. Because it's thought to display the earliest ancient depiction of a biblical figure, Jehu, king of Israel, and we'll We'll meet up with him pretty, pretty quick here. The, <clears throat> the traditional identification of Yah as Jehu has been questioned by some scholars and who propose that the inscription refers to another king, Jehoram of Israel. Its reference to Parsua is also the first known reference to the Persians. Tribute offerings are shown being brought from identifiable regions and peoples. It was erected as a public monument in 825 BC at the time of civil war in the central square of Nimrud, close to the much earlier white obelisk of Ashurna Serpal I. It was discovered, so okay, this one was discovered by archeologist Sir Austin Henry Laird in 1846 and is now in the British Museum. And, uh, and so here again, you know, we see uh, archeology span demonstrating that the Old Testament is accurate, that these people and places really did exist and these, these, events, then, uh, these events then happened. Let's go on here um, <clears throat> on, let's see, it seems like, just a second here. Oh <clears throat> uh, yeah, I think it's, if you, if you flip ahead, if you've got a, a textbook there to page 318, they give a close-up of this black obelisk, uh, the section where it's showing King Jehu of Israel paying tribute or bowing down to the Assyrian king, okay? So you can see him there then in the middle. And then there's other inscriptions there that identify, uh, captions that identify who's, who's in the carving, so in the sculpture. All right, back to page 314. The monarchy in Israel was strictly limited in scope. Not only did a, a king not have the right to assume priestly functions, but, he, but also he was required to respect the rights of each citizen. Ahab recognized this obligation when Naboth of Jezreel refused to sell his vineyard to the king. Much as Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard as an addition to his own holdings, he had no right to force Naboth to sell. Jezebel, however, came from a land where individual rights were not honored as they were in Israel. To her, it was unthinkable that a commoner could stand in the way of a king's desire to enlarge his estate. To secure the vineyard for her husband, Jezebel arranged for the judicial murder of Naboth. Hired witnesses affirmed that Naboth had blasphemed the name of God and of the king. Then Naboth was conducted to a spot outside the city and stoned to death. Jezebel had proved herself a woman who could get her way, and Ahab could enjoy the vineyard he had desired. Elijah the prophet, however, pronounced judgment upon Ahab and his, and his house. Well, it goes on to talk about how Ahab was killed, how Micaiah the prophet uh, was, was consulted, and uh, Ahab is, is killed in, uh, in battle. Um, on page three, uh, yeah, page 316, the last paragraph there talks about how um, Jezebel dies. When Jezebel learned of Jehu's approach, Jehu is then the king in Israel, she dressed up and looked upon the procession from her upper window. She taunted Jehu with being a murderer 
like Zimri. In anger, Jehu ordered that Jezebel be cast to the street from her window. The procession trampled her corpse and the dogs ate her flesh. For the moment, it appeared that the policies of the dynasty of Omri were completely repudiated, but of course they, they won't be. Now, um, in the time we have left, what I wanted to do then in, here in chapter 48, I'll just start reading at the beginning of chapter 48, and then when we get on the next page, I want to show you something else uh, that you just need to be uh, aware of as you read any book, okay? So let's start page, 40, uh, page 317, chapter 48. From Jehu to Jeroboam II. So these are kings in the north, kings of Israel. The year 841 BC marked the beginning of the reigns of Jehu in Israel and Athaliah in Judah. Two people as dissimilar as any in scripture. Jehu was a Yahweh. So I think some, I think a couple of weeks ago or so, I'm, I said that there were no godly kings uh, in the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, I'm not sure if Jehu is in the end going to persevere as a godly king. But, um, but in this case here, it's just a, Ye, uh, Jehu was a Yahweh. He worshiped Yahweh determined to obliterate every remembrance of Baalism. So he, he wanted to effect a big reformation in the north. Athaliah was equally zealous, but her cause was the establishment of a Baalist cult of Ahab and Jezebel in Judah. So she tried to infect the southern kingdom. Jehu took the throne of Israel with the blessing of the prophet Elisha, and the army quickly pledged their loyalty to the new regime. Determining to eradicate the last elements of Baalism from Israel, Jehu enticed the Baal worshippers into their temple. Eighty armed men were stationed at the exits, and at a word from Jehu, they killed the congregation of Baal worshippers in cold blood. Now, you see that term, in cold blood? That's a negative, right? That's a, when you say someone was killed in cold blood, you're not saying it was a good thing. You're saying that it was... It was a crime. This is another example of this author being, being wrong, okay? And I'll, I'll show you that um, in, in a second here. They killed the congregation of Baal worshipers in cold blood. In this way, Jehu sought to purge his land of the taint of Baalism. All the members of the family of Ahab were also slaughtered. Okay, second, that's in 2 Kings 10. Associated with Jehu in his purge of the Baalists was a man named Jehonadab, the son of Rechab. Rechab all right? the, this is, uh, Jehonadab was the first named of a group of Israelites known as the Rechabites, who sought to maintain the older desert traditions in opposition to the vices of an urbanized society. The Rechabites lived in tents instead of houses, and they abstained from the use of intoxicating liquor. As Orthodox Yahwas, they were sympathetic with Jehu in his efforts to exterminate the last remnants of Baal worship from Israel. And you will, we will meet up with the Rechabites um, again in Jeremiah chapter 35. And, they, and the, Lord, the Lord blesses them. Uh, and, and Jeremiah tells about that. Jehu was not a success as a ruler. By alienating the Phoenicians of Tyre and the rulers of Judah, he was forced to stand alone, and Israel was not strong enough for that. Jehu prepared the way for incursions from the north where Hazael of Damascus was building an empire. The biblical historian, the author of First and Second Kings, cannot give Jehu a clean bill of health. Like other kings of the north, quote, he did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam. So here you have Jehu, and he, he starts off to purge the land of all this evil, 
that the Lord, and, and he's doing God's will in doing it, um, and, uh, and yet, ultimately, his heart wasn't wholly given to the Lord, and he, he, he continues to allow worship of the, uh, the calf shrines in, where is it, Bethel and somewhere else, um, that Jeroboam, the first uh, king of the northern kingdom, had erected, okay, the false worship centers, and so he compromised there. Now, in this paragraph, again, you see the author of this history book. Um, well, I think, I actually, I think what we could call it is, coming through is, the guy is using human wisdom here, okay? He's saying, you know, um, well, let me give you an example. When I was a pastor in Montana, uh, there was just all kinds of people there that claimed to be Christians and they weren't and we're having some confrontations with them and, and confronting them and so forth. And there was one guy in, our, in the church, he was kind of a leader in the church, and he, he uh, um, uh, came up to me one day and talked to me and he said, you know, Jeff, you're not going to be successful as a pastor if you don't learn to be a better politician. Okay. That's, that's what, which that's totally bogus, okay? That's what this guy is, that's what the author of this book does. Still a good book, but you have to be aware of this. In my opinion, what he's saying here, Jehu should have been a better politician, right? He shouldn't have been so radical in wiping out these Baal worshipers. He should have, uh, uh, you know... If he shouldn't have alienated the Phoenicians and, and, uh, and, and, and other people. He should have been a better, a better politician. Well, what his real problem is, is that he is playing politics, okay? He's still, he's, he's, uh, he's pulling back. He's compromising with the world. He doesn't... Um, he doesn't also go ahead and destroy those false worship, uh, false worship centers, you see. And uh, so at any rate, we'll need to watch for that. Now, here's, we've got time to look at this one final example on page 318. Check this out. Look at what this uh, author says. Jehu's purge, his purge of the land of the Baal worshipers, okay, had disastrous effects for Israel. Now, let me, let's look at, um, let me pull this verse up here on the screen. This is going to be 2 Kings 10 here. And it's verse 28 to 31. Okay, see Jehu goes ahead, you can see it on the heading here at chapter 10. He goes ahead and he wipes out Ahab's descendants, okay? He wipes them out too. And, uh, and we have all of the uh, account of them, of them doing that, all right? Um, so we come down here. Jehu strikes down the prophets of Baal, okay? He's doing all of this. When you get down to verse 28, look at this. Thus Jehu wiped out Baal from Israel, but, Je but Jehu did not turn aside from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin, that is the golden calves that were in Bethel and Dan. And the Lord said to Jehu, because you have done well in carrying out what is right in my eyes and have done to the house of Ahab, i.e. slaughtering them, wiping them out, according to all that was in my heart, in the Lord's heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But Jehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart, 
He did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin. All right, now think about this carefully. Once again, is Jehu's problem that he wasn't a good politician? Is Jehu's problem that he went too far and he, he didn't treat these Baal worshipers kindly enough, you know? He wiped them, he wiped them all out and, and the descendants of Ahab. Is that, what, is that what's wrong? No. In fact, God blesses him for it. He says, because you have done well in carrying out what's right in my eyes and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. So God blesses him for doing that, for, care, for wiping out these, um, these evil people from the nation. But look at what the, uh, um, in fact, as I said then, he didn't go far enough. He should have wiped out those other worship centers too, false worship centers. Now look at this, listen to this author then. Jehu's purge had dis disastrous effects for Israel. No, it didn't. Jehu's um, continuing to walk in sin is what had disastrous effect. While it seemed to be a victory over Baalism, the ruthless manner in which it was carried out antagonized even Yahweh's prophets. Hosea records the Lord's message to his generation, yet a little while, and I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel. Now, I think we're out of time. Here's what I'm going to do. <clears throat> I'm going to stop right there, and we'll plan to pick up at that point. And we say, well, wait a minute. How can Hosea, how can the Lord say through Hosea, yet a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, when we just read in 2 Kings that God blessed him for, for doing that. What, what, is, what is going on here? Well, what's going on is that the author of this book is misinterpreting what Hosea had to say. And, uh, and so we'll, you can, maybe you can try to figure that out yourself. It's Hosea, uh, what is it, Hosea 1.4. Um, Think about that this week, and we'll come back to that point next time. Father, we thank you for your holiness. We thank you for uh, the fact that we know the day will come when you will uh, destroy evil and wickedness once and for all. And we thank you that you, you see everything, that you, you protect your people. And we pray, Father, that uh, we would... In, uh, that our faith and trust in you would increase. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.